so today I'm going to talk about uh, so uh, a problem what we call like time state analytics. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about like what we do at Conviva. Uh, what is Conviva? Why is it that we are actually solving a very hard like streaming analytics problem? Uh, some examples of like how we have tried to solve this with like classical tools and why we've actually had to build a, a custom solution uh, to reach the scale and the expressivity we needed uh, for the kinds of problems we solve. Okay. Uh, so I'm Vyas and this is Henry. Uh, and uh, so we sort of developed this platform at Conviva uh, to solve some of the world's most challenging problems uh, in modeling user experience at scale. Right? So what is Conviva? So, so what Conviva does is we actually help some of the largest media conglomerates uh, understand model and optimize uh, user experience in real time. So we saw some of these uh, uh, numbers from the keynotes in terms of the, the scale at which people are running like Kafka deployments and Flink deployments and so on. Uh, so we actually run a pretty large uh, event monitoring platform ourselves. Uh, so we actually support 12 of the 15 largest media conglomerates, uh, uh, internet uh, OTT uh, players out there. Uh, we have more than 7 billion sensors deployed. Uh, that's like internet scale, right? pretty much like every uh, device out there. Uh, we model and monitor uh, 220 billions of billion uh, video streams, uh, almost like 5 trillion events per day. Right? We saw uh, large numbers and large scales. So we're actually modeling and, and monitoring a much larger scale than many things we've seen over there. Uh, 500 million unique viewers and up to like 30 million concurrent viewers watching uh, some of the largest internet scale uh, video events, events out there. Right? So we are really supporting some of the largest online uh, user experience uh, uh, entities out there right now. Okay? So what is it that we do is uh, Conviva has built uh, an operational data platform that helps our customers monitor and optimize user experience over these event streams at scale. Right? So we have these different event sensors and app sensors and video sensors that sent in uh, events from uh, client devices. Uh, in, in this case, uh, for the video OTT, it collects a lot of like raw video events. Uh, on top of these events, uh, our, our customers are able to ru run complex uh, user experience and ex engagement modeling analytics on top of it uh, using our proprietary time state analytics engine. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then on top of that, that actually drives uh, their operations. right? So the top names that you saw out there are using our operational data platform to monitor the quality of experience that their users face at internet scale in real time and drill down into performance problems. right? Maybe there is a device failure. Maybe there is an internet outage. Maybe there is a, a CDN problem. So those are the kinds of things we help our customers monitor uh, and analyze in real time so that they can maximize user engagement and their business uh, outcomes, right? So the, what we do is measure the quality of experience or user experience metrics that actually matter uh, to video uh, quality of experience. So for example, uh, a lot of our clients do over-the-top uh, video, right? So internet video, if you're watching anything on your, uh, on your phone, on your devices, on your smart TVs, chances are you are expecting a high quality of experience, and our providers, our customers, are trying to optimize these things for you, right? So, and we have actually defined some of the industry-leading metrics uh, in the internet OTT space, uh, metrics like connection-induced uh, rebuffering, right? You actually, uh, our, our customers want to monitor how much time did a particular viewing session spend in buffering, right? You know these annoying things where like you start, oh, okay, that is not good. Okay, uh, so, so metrics like connection-induced rebuffering are things that they want to monitor, like, okay, do you actually have this buffering? Did, a, did, did like a player quit in the middle of me, like my machine just quit? This is not part of the show. <laughs> this is not part of the narrative. Uh, and they actually need to model this at scale, right? For every single uh, user that they see, every single device, they actually have to model things like, did they exit because of a te technical failure like me? <laughs> did they have like a buffering problem? Uh, did they actually have like CDN issues? Uh, did they actually have like low quality, right? If you're actually watching on a smart TV, you expect like a high quality on a 4K TV, right? You don't want like 480p on a 4K TV, your experience would be pretty terrible. So those are the kinds of things that our customers are looking to model. Uh, okay, all right, we are back online. So, so what we do is monitor all these kinds of like complex uh, events at scale uh, to monitor these metrics like okay, rebuffering related exits, connected in, connection induced rebuffering, uh, exits before the start of a video player, the average bitrate, and so on. 
And all of these metrics are actually critical to drive the operational decisions that our customers, right? They may want to change the CDN, they want to model uh, or, or monitor whether the user is likely to churn, they may need to do like a player software upgrade, like maybe my, my computer needs an upgrade right now, uh, or they need to rebalance the load across the various servers that they've chosen. Now, the common factor across all of these things is that these metrics, uh, if you look at like monitoring these event streams to compute these metrics, they are highly stateful, complex, sophisticated metrics. They are stateful and context sensitive metrics, and these are actually critical for driving the operations at our customers, right? So using these metrics, uh, they actually measure a benchmark called the streaming performance index. So each of these stateful metrics, like connection-induced buffering, exit before start, the average bitrate, the video player failures, are used by our customers almost as a, as a benchmark for monitoring their performance in real time. And these are the metrics or KPIs they look to optimize uh, to, to measure their own performance. Okay. Uh, so this is what the operational data platform does. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, why is this problem hard. And before that, I actually want to get into a little bit about what is stateful analytics, right? Why is this a hard problem, right? So I, I, I mentioned the word that these are like stateful uh, context-sensitive metrics. Uh, and we use the word stateful a lot in streaming processing. It's useful to clarify what I mean by stateful here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by stateful analytics, uh, and then why sort of traditional solutions have failed us. Okay. Uh, and, and to a lot of you in the room, you actually probably also know. You've used Flink, you've used Kafka, you've probably used Spark, you've probably used a whole bunch of these tools. And you know that stateful analytics is a challenging big data streaming problem, right? Monitoring event streams at scale to compute these kind of stateful metrics in real time uh, is actually a very challenging problem. So let's, let's take an example, right? This is from our domain. So this is from the video domain. Uh, where we actually want to compute a metric called the connection-induced rebuffering. That's, that's a mouthful, so I'll actually walk you through what that metric actually means. So, so imagine, so these are example uh, events that we actually get from a video player, right? So these are the raw measurements that we get. So I remember I mentioned like we're getting like trillions of events. These are the events those players are sending us. Uh, so these measure these me events measure the player state. Uh, they measure things like user actions, did they rewind, did they fast forward, did they seek? Uh, they measure things like bitrate changes, right? You actually want to monitor, uh, everybody is using like an, uh, like an adaptive bitrate algorithm, you want to monitor if it's working well at scale. Uh, also, what CDN or server you are using at any given point of time. Okay? So we collect a lot of these metrics, a lot of these events and, 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 and that come in real time, and we need to measure things like the connection-induced rebuffering. Now, what do I mean by connection-induced rebuffering? is actually a, a fairly sophisticated metric that our clients want to uh, develop. Now, buffering can happen at many points in your uh, video session. right? If you ever clicked on like Netflix or Amazon and tried to watch, there is going to be some buffering at the beginning because the player is trying to boot up some of his video state. So there's going to be buffering at the beginning. That's inevitable, unavoidable. That is not connection-induced. That's just like accept a, you have to accept that as a state of reality. There are other buffering that can happen because you decided to pause, you decided to rewind or fast forward, or do a seek action. So those are re buffering related to user actions. That's not a problem with the connection. That is, again, an unavoidable buffering because the user decided to seek forward where the player, had the player did not have the content to play. So what we actually care about when you are measuring things like the server performance, the CDN performance, is connection-induced rebuffering. That is, buffering that's happening not because of initialization, not because of user actions, but something that can be uniquely attributed to the, the state of the internet connection between the player and the CDN. Right? So this is already pretty, pretty complicated. So in this case, again, this is like a highly simplified view. Actual metric is much more complicated. If I want to look at connection-induced rebuffering, uh, I actually want to measure things like, hey, is, what is the duration of buffering where the player is currently buffering? The play has initialized, that it is, I'm, I'm discounting the buffering that happened during initialization. And the, the user has not seeked in the last five seconds. Again, this is the policy logic our customers define. It's like, OK, I should discount buffering that happened because of seeks. And in this case, I'm looking for CDNC1, because if CDNC1 uh, is, 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 is having performance issues, I might want to switch this client to a different CDN to maximize their user experience. Right? So again, you already see it's like a stateful metric where I have to carefully model the sequence of events, the user actions, uh, the inter-arrival inter time between these events, and the history of the player, and so on. Right? It's already a, it's, you can see that I have to carefully model the interactions between these events. 
Now, OK, this is a very complex example, right? OK, uh, we've had like 15 years of domain experience to develop these kinds of complicated metrics. So let me take a simpler example to explain what I mean by stateful analytics. Uh, that is something that all of us in this room can understand, right? So, so maybe the video domain, only like a few of us can really, really appreciate the sophistication of the metric. Let me make a, take a simpler example. Okay, so so I have a Garmin watch. Probably everybody has like an uh, like a like a fitness tracker or a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and so on. And you can probably see the data coming out of that, right? It's it's sending a bunch of raw events. So let's say it's measuring time, it's measuring stress, what activity you're doing, uh, what's your sleep status, uh, some complicated fitness metrics like VO2. I have no idea how that's computed, but there's something called VO2 that's apparently a good metric. But, uh, and then there's like the heart rate and so on, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that come from a fitness tracker uh, that are basically giving you these events in real time. Okay, so now on this fitness tracker, I actually may care about different kinds of analysis I may want to do, right? You are actually interested in health outcomes and you want to say, let me measure my health outcome, uh, look at how stressed am I, am I stressed at work? Right? Am I taking too many meetings at work and I'm stressed for too long? All these kinds of things I may care about my health outcomes. Okay? Uh, now, in the most simple case, with classical uh, SQL tabular analytics, you can just look at this table and say, what, what can I do is start counting events. Right? You might do very simple things. Let me count the number of activities I did. Let me count the number of stress events that came. Right? Let me count the average stress and so on. Now, these are what I would call uh, stateless analytics, right? They are stateless in the sense that they are agnostic or independent of the sequence, the timing, and the system state in which they happen, right? For example, uh, if I'm counting the number of activity events, imagine I permute those events, right? Say work happened before rest, or rest happened after run, the number of events will remain the same or I change the time between rest and work. Say I woke up at like, whatever, I, I woke up very late, I woke up at 8.30 instead of 6 a.m., I would still get the same answer, right? So the time between events does not matter, the sequence of events does not matter, the order of events does not matter, and also does not matter what my stress level was at that point of time, right? So these are the kinds of simple stateless analytics that you can do in a spreadsheet, you can do using SQL, you can do using like tabular uh, mental models, right? And this is what we've come to learn and love for the longest time, right? This is like classical uh, SQL-like analytics. I would call them stateless, right? So I can permute, I can change the order of rows, you'll still get the same answer. SQL, most, for the most part, does not care about the order in which the, the values come. Now, on the other hand, of course, this, these, are, these are useful for many use cases, but if I actually care about my health outcome, this is not very useful, right? Why do I care how many events I did? That's not very helpful. What I may actually care about is things like, hey, uh, am I stressed at work? Am I taking too many meetings? Am I stressed for a prolonged amount of time? Maybe I need to take mini breaks, right? Those are the kinds of things I actually care about uh, for my health outcomes might actually be stateful metrics where I care about things like, is my stress level high? Say for example, say, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but imagine greater than or equal to six is a high stress level, okay? Somebody's decided this. And I wanna check whether my average stress is high when I'm at work, right? So maybe I'm at Confluent, I'm current, I'm like very chill, but I'm at work, I'm maybe very stressed. And I want to check whether uh, is my average stress high when I'm working. Also, I may check whether am I in stress for a prolonged amount of time, right? If you're in a high stress state for a prolonged amount of time, you have an extreme prolonged exposure to stress, that might be bad. So ultimately, if I care about health outcomes, I may think about things like the duration of stress, right? I care about the stress when I'm in a particular state. And you can consider other examples as well, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you run. So if you run, some of the advice for running says, hey, keep running in an aerobic range, whatever that means, right? So aerobic range is like some 120 to 140 uh, heart rate or something. So you actually want to keep your running pace in that aerobic range for as much time as possible, right? It may not seem like much, but that's a stateful computation, right? I'm checking my, my heart rate and, my, and, and making sure I'm there in a prolonged duration of time. So essentially, you'll see across many of these examples is that the things that matter to uh, outcomes are actually stateful analysis. Right? It's not just the raw counts, it's stateful modeling of a dynamic system. And you can actually think about every single domain I can think about 
stateful analytics is very critical. Right? I gave you an example from video, this sort of toy example from the fitness domain. Uh, we've heard a lot about like fraud detection, a bunch of keynote talks, talks about like fraud detection. Fraud detection is a stateful problem, right? I want to check whether have you made purchases at geographically distant locations in the last five minutes, within, within five minutes of each other, right? So that ma the sequence of transactions matter, the order of transactions matter, right? And the time between transactions matter. That's a stateful problem. You can think about cybersecurity, right? So part of my research, I also work on cybersecurity. Anything where I'm trying to detect if a machine has been compromised. Every single compromise indicator I can think of is a stateful analytics problem. For example, we may think about, hey, after visiting this website, you got a drive-by download attack, which is like some website has attacked you. Now you start sending a whole bunch of random DNS requests uh, in, a, in a short amount of time. Right? After I clicked, some crap happened. <laughs> right? That's that's bad thing. That's a compromise indicator. That's a stateful problem. Manufacturing, you actually want to model the health of a system to rebalance and reload and repair. There's a lot of interest in like uh, in industry 4.0 and like proactive maintenance and predictive maintenance. Every one of those things is a stateful problem, right? So stateful analytics appears in every single domain I can think of, uh, and it's actually critical for driving the operational outcomes. And we've seen this for modeling user experience at scale for our consumer scale uh, uh, customers, right? You want to m measure things like engagement. The actionable insights from the event streams really depends on being able to model the state of the system, the dynamic behavior of users, and so on. Right? Uh, so from raw event streams and telemetry you're collecting, to actually tie it to your business outcomes in any single domain, you need the stateful analytics layer to be able to get these fine-grained insights on connecting raw events to, tele to the actual ins uh, outcomes that matter. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the primer on stateful analytics. So now actually tell me, uh, let me tell you uh, why is it that is actually not well supported by existing systems, right? So we've had like sort of several decades of innovation in big data and streaming tech, which is awesome, very cool innovations that have happened. But this class of problems is not well supported by the status quo, right? I think we've talked a lot about stateful functions, we've talked a lot about streaming, uh, but this class of problems is still like sort of not very well supported. Okay. Uh, so here's an example, right? So I, I sort of I gave you this sort of toy fitness example where I'm measuring the uh, the average the, the the total duration of high stress when I'm working, right? So count the total duration of time I'm in a high stress when I'm working. Now uh, you don't have to look at that code. That's the hairy, crazy SQL code you have to write to do this fairly simple intent, right? It's an easy to express intent, but to write it in SQL or some kind of streaming logic, it requires like some hundreds of lines of code and I have no way of understanding if it's correct. I have no way of debugging if it's correct. And I actually don't know if it actually meets my intent. Now, this is actually not just a hypothetical problem. We've actually faced this, right? We've actually faced this kind of problem when we try to write these kinds of quality of experience metrics for the customers, right? Using existing platforms, existing streaming systems, existing database platforms. And we've had like many, many generations of these uh, using state of the art platforms like. Uh, Hadoop, Spark, Flink, take your favorite, pick your favorite. We have tried to write these over and over again, uh, over multiple generations. In, in fact, sort of the history of Conviva almost mirrors the history of big data. We've tried every single platform as it emerges, and we've suffered every single time. Uh, and, and, and what it results is, is sort of a high development effort uh, in terms of writing and supporting these kinds of stateful analytics. Uh, and it also results in a high cost, right? Uh, it's not just like a painful for a human to understand what's going on. It's also painful for a database optimizer to understand what's going on, right? You cannot actually optimize, do uh, query planning, query optimizations once you run into these sort of complex, uh, hairy SQL code. And that's the truth, right? We actually have tried these, and we've suffered many, many times. Uh, and, the, and then the root cause is that this kind of stateful analytics is actually not well supported. And the reality is really that most of the existing uh, sort of uh, big data systems uh, actually stem from this really cool idea, right? The tabular abstraction. Relational algebra is a Turing award-winning, sort of the award-winning work uh, from EF Card, uh, which, is like, which is basically the foundation of everything out there today in big data, right? Uh, and they came up with this sort of, he came up with this idea of like a, tab a relational algebra, the tabular model, and that has been the foundation of every data te technology we've had for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Data is modeled at relations and tables, and you have like SQL or relational algebra to manipulate these things. 
Now, which is great. So relational algebra is fantastic if you want to do like simple state, stateless SQL table, tabular computations. It starts to fail when you start to do like stateful, sequential, event processing computations. Okay. Uh, so let me see, like, sort of again, walk you through a little bit more on why tabular model is not well suited for the stateful computation. So remember the sort of event stream uh, that we got from the video player. Now, a tabular model is actually great if you actually want to just like represent the data as an event stream. You can say, let me put it in a, in a, in a table with a timestamp column and a bunch of events column for each type of event that I see. It's a perfectly reasonable representation of the data as it comes. What it is not good for is not a good abstraction for processing the data. Right? This is a great event store. I can put it in my data warehouse. I can put it in my data lake. But if I want to write a query on top of it, I, get, I start suffering. Why? So let's take an example. Right? If I just want to do things like, when am I currently buffering using CDN, I have to sort of essentially start filling in the table right buffer event comes i have to like sort of logically fill in the table of when buffering is happening then i have to carefully model the duration of buffering for every row so i have to like sort of sequentially process everything and not just that i also have to like sort of do like a logical correlation with when am i using cdn1 right this is just for parts 1 and parts 4 of this sort of logical query uh, durations are actually extremely painful right unless these are like sort of nicely doing nicely sort of discretized in some way Computing durations in SQL is pretty hard. Uh, not just that, I actually have to do things like, have I seeked in the last five seconds? Right? Uh, that turns out to be this hairy snippet of SQL just to model, have I seeked in the last five seconds? Right? It's easy for me to tell you in English what I want. That turns out to be this like, hairy code that, like, okay, multiple PhDs have looked at this code, they cannot debug this code. Right? Just trust me, it's right, but you do not want to be able to, you do not want to have this kind of code uh, in your production system. Things go wrong, you cannot debug. Things are not performant, you cannot debug. Okay. Uh, so this is the status quo, right? Again, we've, we actually have run this for many, many years. We've actually bit the bullet, written on top of the sort of existing abstractions, because that's the best bad idea we had. And then we realized that actually we need a better abstraction, right? Uh, the existing systems that are all driven from this sort of tabular mental model uh, are suffering because of the people, we've given people a bad tool, right? If people, like our developers are smart, right? You give them like a, you give them an abstraction, they will sort of like contrive to use their abstraction to solve their problem, right? I give them a bad hammer, they will still use the bad hammer, and they will struggle to do that. But the, the truth is, we've actually given them a bad hammer, right? If only we had given them the right hammer, they would be like so much happier, so much more productive, uh, and can do a lot more things with the right abstraction. And and that's really sort of the the the, the, the crux of what we did is so we sort of cracked the code on what is the right abstraction for this kind of stateful analytics. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about how we tackled this problem uh, and, and, and sort of logically what we did. So I'm going to go back to the fitness example. Uh, so as I said, the table is a perfectly reasonable representation of an event stream. It's not a great representation for processing the data. Right? Uh, so imagine we go back to first principles and I asked you, hey, uh, we're not writing SQL. Forget SQL. We're not writing code. We are just humans, humans in a room with a whiteboard. What would you do? Right? So humans on a whiteboard, what would we do? Right? Uh, and that's a good question for us to ask. And that's the visual abstraction. We are visual thinkers. We are geometric thinkers. And you say, OK, if I gave you this problem, what would you do? And naturally, what any human would do is start doing a visual interpretation of the data. Right? A human, so our human brain is programmed to do like a visual interpretation of data. Right? I would say, let me draw a timeline of the stress level the x-axis being time, and the y-axis is the stress level as, as a state, as sort of a step function over time, right? And indeed, there's actually a, a, a very, very sort of insightful and powerful quote by Fred Brooks. If you've read The Mythical Man Month, uh, one of the fathers of like software engineering. Uh, so he made this interesting point uh, in, in one of his papers that uh, real world engineering is good because people have like a geometric abstraction, people have a visual representation or understanding of the real world. Like this is why architecture, bridges, civil engineering is okay. And he was like, software engineering is hard because we do not have a visual interpretation of the data. Right? So if only software had a geometric abstraction, if only SQL had a geometric abstraction, we would be so much better. Uh, so again, so we're sort of inspired by this quote by, uh, by Fred Brooks and said, okay, if I actually had to go back to first principles and do it as if I did on a whiteboard, what would I do? 
we would draw a visual timeline interpretation of the data. So as I said, x-axis being time, uh, the y-axis being the stress level as a function of time. And if I just ask you what is the duration of high stress, it's easy. It's trivial, right? I just look at, oh, OK, y-axis is greater than or equal to 6. And then I just do like an integral, shade that region. That's the answer. It's as easy as that. It's just, it turns out to be Harry SQL code because we gave you a bad abstraction for it. If I had given you this abstraction and a whiteboard, you would have ans answered this question in like two minutes. SQL is probably 20 minutes and then maybe another two hours of debugging and another two hours of performance optimization. Right? This is literally a 20 second problem. So there's this, there's this fundamental disconnect between the, 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 the how we should be solving the problem and how the tools force us to solve this problem. Right? And that's the disconnect we are trying to bridge here. And you can see the geometric view actually makes it very, very easy uh, to resolve this problem and to do stateful analytics. And, and that's really sort of the, uh, the, the, the foundation of what we built uh, as part of the time state uh, platform, is we can actually express all these complex stateful analytics using a very simple visual or geometric logic. Right? If I want to just say, hey, how long was I in high, st high stress state, uh, you basically say, interpret the column called stress as a step function or a state over time, check when the stress is greater than or equal to 6, and calculate the duration by just shading the region when it's greater than 6, when it's true. Right? It's literally as easy as that. But I just can't write this in SQL. Right? I can't write this in SQL. It would be very painful. I mean, somebody showed me yesterday like, a, like an anomaly detection in Flink, and it's like 300 lines of Java code. Right? But logically, this is all I want to do. So the time state analytics platform in a nutshell is essentially a new paradigm for stateful analytics. Right? So we have a new data model or a new sort of data abstraction with different kinds of natural timeline dynamics. Right? So how does the real world evolve? Uh, there are discrete events. There are like states or step functions. And there are these sort of continuous measurements. And that's pretty general. You can model most event streams or data or telemetry or collecting in one of those three data models. Right? Discrete events, states over time, or continuously evolving measurements over time. So on top of that, we basically have a, a new library of like sort of intuitive visual operators. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what these operators are in a second. And then a compositional language, like what you just saw earlier. Right? This is a compositional language, a, a declarative language for expressing my logic on top of the operators to get the metrics or the analysis of, in, uh, of, of, of interest. And then we can have like connectors to external sources. You can say, I can publish the analysis to a Kafka topic. I can put it in a database for uh, further uh, multidimensional aggregation or other kinds of OLAP analysis and so on. So in a nutshell, we have a new paradigm for stateful analysis with a new data abstraction, a, a declarative language, and a library of intuitive operators. So, so here's an example of an operator we want over timelines. So here's a very simple greater than or equal to operator. right? I have a timeline of stress over time. x-axis is time, y-axis is stress value. And I say, hey, show me greater than or equal to 6 with a true-false value. Very simple. Point-wise, you check when it is greater than or equal to 6. And then you create a new timeline, which is true, say, after 7.30, and false before 7.30. Right? I was stressed after 6, 7.30. I was stressed, or not stressed before 7.30. Right? So this is an example of an operator we want to define, a greater than or equal to over time. Uh, we may have like more complicated operators that are like modeling things like durations or aggregations. If I want to do things like, OK, what is the time you were stressed? I want to say, I want to calculate the duration you were true as a function of time. Right? So I have the true-false timeline. And I check how long were you in a true state. So as a function of time, I can say, OK, at 7.30, you're still 0. And then I slowly have like a piecewise linear increasing function that's modeling the duration of the value, the state was value equal to true. Again, this is an operator. It's a stateful operator that's modeling durations uh, as a function of time. And I can, we can actually have like many more operators. You can define your custom operators. Uh, and that's essentially what we can do. Right? It's, like, it's a visual way of thinking about data processing, a visual way of thinking about stateful analytics that dramatically simplifies uh, both the ease of development and the performance. Okay? And I'll tell you about this. So here's an example. Right? So, uh, uh, the, the, the previous metric about the fitness example, if I have event data, I have an operator called get state, I have an operator called greater than or equal to, I have an operator called duration true, that's it. It's literally three lines of code compared to the Harry SQL I had to write. Uh, you can have like more complex metrics. What, how long was I a stress, uh, in, in stress state and I was resting? You can just extend that basic DAG to add like more if conditions and say do a logical AND between the stress and the state. You get duration of true of resting, 
and high stress. Right? So you can sort of logically extend these things to create more sophisticated metrics uh, as you need them. Now, this is not just like a hypothetical abstraction. This is an actually an abstraction that has helped us in production. Right? So this was the Harry metric, the, the sort of the complex SQL code we had to write uh, before. Uh, again, I'm using SQL as an example because it's like sort of the, 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 the tool that most data analysts would go to. But you'll have similar problems with Flink and Spark and every Spark SQL and every other uh, framework you can think about. Now, changing that to the timeline sort of uh, language uh, or the timeline abstraction dramatically reduces the sort of the code complexity because you have a simpler uh, abstraction. So the onboarding to create new metrics or new kinds of analysis for customers dropped dramatically from weeks to days. Right. So this whole debugging cycle of understanding what SQL is, debugging it, making sure it's performant, just went away. And more importantly, we also have like much fewer semantic bugs. Right? This 35 line, again, this is actually a highly compact, compressed version that we wrote after like many days of workshopping this. If there is a semantic bug in this, right? if customer reports, hey, the semantic of this metric doesn't look right, I'm like, OK, now debugging that is extremely painful. Debugging like the four lines of declarative code is a lot easier. Right? Semantic bugs drop dramatically uh, inside our production system. Uh, and sometimes, OK, so one natural question is, hey, sometimes going to a higher level of abstraction uh, causes you performance. Right? So does the abstraction result in a performance drop? And this is sort of the, 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 sort of the, the win-win situation. Moving to a better abstraction actually yielded a significantly higher performance than classical systems. Right? So here's a, here's a, a sort of a, a micro benchmark that we did uh, supporting the kinds of workloads that we had uh, and comparing against like, state of the art systems. Right? We said, OK, what if we had to support like, a Kanviva like workload uh, using Flink, uh, using Flink for stateful part and using ClickHouse for the multi dimensional part, uh, or using Spark Streaming or Spark plus ClickHouse? We've tried a whole bunch of these combinations uh, and we benchmarked sort of the normalized cost. Right? Think about like the cost performance trade-offs or the number of CPU cycles. This is like a normalized cost number. And this is the beauty of it, right? By moving to a higher level abstraction, we actually get significantly better performance because we can now enable new structure of our optimizations that the classical systems cannot do. Right? If 30 different developers are writing 30 different metrics, a compiler or a query planner cannot find cross query patterns, cannot find common patterns, cannot do optimizations, because everybody is writing their own little code. By moving to a declarative language, by moving to a higher level abstraction, we are able to achieve, uh, again, this is like a very, very conservative estimate, because uh, we were trying to be very con conservative here. We are getting more than an order of magnitude performance win against classical systems. Right? And these are, again, industry standard, industry leading systems that have been matured and sort of uh, optimized over multiple generations. Uh, and our system is able to beat them uh, sort of a, uh, at scale, even in a micro benchmark. And the good news is actually it's even better. As people add more metrics, right? as the sophistication of your operations becomes more, becomes, uh, more complicated, uh, the win from our system is much better. We can actually do reuse a lot more across operations, across different uh, developers, and the win, the normalized gap, becomes even better. Right? So this is actually a conservative estimate uh, in an operational setting. We, we, the, the, the better abstraction is yielding an order of magnitude better performance, and the trend is actually better as your operational complexity grows. OK, I uh, think I'm sort of at the, uh, like sort of uh, summarizing the time. Uh, so let me sort of, sort of briefly summarize the takeaways from what this sort of whole idea of time state analytics is. Right? Uh, now, across many, many domains, again, uh, modeling user experience for video or app as one example, across many domains, cybersecurity, fintech, IoT, there is this very critical need for real-time stateful analytics. Again, by stateful, I mean analytics that depends on the sequence, the timing, and the order in which events happen, not just like broad counts of what happened. Uh, this turns out to be a fundamentally hard computational problem for big data systems, and the reason being that they all stem from this classical tabular and even now, we're still struggling and striving to do like streaming SQL, right? Because that's the language we're familiar with. So we're sort of, sort of contriving to use like a tabular model on top of a streaming system. Uh, that results in a high cost and low performance and high development effort and a lot of semantic bugs at scale for the kind of operational workloads we're looking at. Now, again, through the, the, the evolution and through multiple generations of working with all of these streaming and big data systems, we realize there's this fundamental gap. This is not a good abstraction. The classical systems that force you into a tabular way of thinking 
are a bad abstraction for this class of problems. So we came up with a new geometric basis where you can have intuitively view these as timelines, visualize the logic that you want to do, and express these in a much more simpler manner. So we sort of refer this as like sort of, it's democratizing this complex problem, right? I don't need a PhD. I don't need to be an expert Scala Flink, Flink programmer to write this complex sophisticated analysis. Anybody can come and do it. And, and, the, and the good news is actually that, that raising the level of abstraction uh, does not cost performance and perhaps counterintuitively actually improves performance dramatically. It's 10x better in terms of performance while still being much easier to use. Uh, and again, We've done this for uh, user experience at scale, but again, our hypothesis is this sort of this problem uh, and the solution can extend far beyond uh, the use cases that we've looked at so far. Uh, so if you have use cases in your, uh, in your sort of, uh, uh, in your domains where you're thinking about stateful analytics, uh, would love to hear about the use cases and how we can help and help democratize this platform to uh, an idea to more use cases. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch, uh, but it all worked out well. Thank you.